Council helped set up the Chicago Housing Authority in 1937, uh, and, and in fact the council sent their first executive director over to the CHA, and uh, that person became the CHA's first director, Elizabeth Wood, and helped set up the policies and the procedures and all the things that went into creating, at that time, one of the most progressive and most exciting of housing authorities in the country. In one of the country's biggest cities. And for a good nearly 20 years, it operated as an exemplary authority. People were coming from all over the world to see how low-income people were housed in Chicago because it was done with great sensitivity, good design, with a real understanding of the needs of the people occupying the housing. 
and a real uh, sense of the needs of the community too. These were, were developments at that time that integrated well with the community and were essentially good examples of what government can do. Elizabeth Wood left in 1954 under duress and the, there were a lot of, of things going on at that time. I think the two things that were most important were that she uh, no longer had the support of the mayor of Chicago for those early years. The mayor was extremely supportive and interesting, that supportive in a way that was kind of hands off. The Housing Authority had a job to do, and Mayor Kelly at that time essentially let the authority do its job. Uh, following Mayor, Mayor Kennelly was not so supportive and essentially wanted to be involved politically in the distribution of housing in the city and essentially didn't want housing that would house minorities built in white neighborhoods. Uh, and the City Council of Chicago got uh, legislation passed at the state level that would make it impossible to locate housing in the city without the permission of the City Council, which means without the permission of the aldermen, which means that aldermen in white wards were fighting at that time. And so after that, after about 19, um, uh, about 54 was when, when Wood left, she was fighting for racially integrated housing, it wasn't a popular thing to fight for in those days. And she was fighting for dispersed housing, and that was becoming more and more impossible. So what we have then, and you can see the real change of what was built prior to that date and after that date, is that housing became more and more confined, uh, more and more isolated, located in one neighborhood, and then it would just expand. And because of the limited availability of acceptable land, High rises got built instead of low rises. It was also the architectural theme of the time, this idea of great high rises in park settings. What we got from that point on is much denser housing in higher rise buildings, uh, more and more large units so that the ratio of kids to adults becomes real problematic, and more and more economic and uh, social and racial isolation. So we've wound up in Chicago with one of the most economically and racially segregated public housing authorities in the country. My name is Cora Moore. I'm a resident for, in 1230 Berlin for the past 30 years. I'm the mother of six kids. Uh, now I have two still at home. My name is Dolores Wilson. I'm a resident of 1230 North Berlin. And I am the mother of five children, and I have one at home. My name is Dorian Scott. I'm a resident of 1230 North Burling. I've been here 29 years. I'm a mother of three. Both of my kids is grown. My oldest son was just 30 when I moved in here. He was seven months old. He's a graduate student from Eastern University. When I was growing up here, we had a lot of activities. We had a nice playground. It was beautiful. It was integrated. I know. Uh, they were very strict, okay? And it was mostly a two-parent families that was here. Um, most of uh, neighbors looked out for each other. They took care of each other's children as I was growing up. We always had something to do, like every Friday and Saturday night we'll have a skating party or we'll go to, uh, into another building to have dances. The schools was, was much better then, okay? They was very good with discipline, uh, sponsoring different things for kids to do. They also talk with the children and help them to decide what they wanted to be when they grow up. Also, the parents was here to do the same thing, to talk with the children, to take interest in us, because I was a child growing up here. So like Dorian said, we had the playground, they had the Lower North Center, we, they utilized the Lower North Center quite a bit when we were about 10, 12, 15 years old. Now. Things changed when the two cops got killed. Back in the 60s, 68, 67. No, 68, 69, when the two policemen got killed. Uh, that's when Cabrini became a household name. Okay. Um, but still, even in all, when the, when the two policemen did get killed, we still had things to do. 
we had places to go, things to see. Clearly, uh, residents of public housing are the victim of the crime that's perpetuated in public housing. There's no question about that. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of people are uh, good citizens uh, and law-abiding. There uh, remain within the public housing five to ten percent of a population which uh, terrorizes, I think, many of the other residents and give uh, the reputation to the entire population of that community a bad reputation. What brings us to this problem is that the CHA has failed in its landlord responsibilities, if you will, uh, and uh, that uh, what is required is some new uh, force uh, that can only, I think, come from the tenants that, that require them to meet their obligations. We are supporting and what they are seeking is increased empowerment to have some say in uh, the quality of living in their community. TMC, as we call it, is tenants managing their public housing developments or buildings with a management contract from the PHA, which is the public housing authority. That's what tenant management is. My name is Bertha Gilkey. I'm the president of Cochran Tenant Management Corporation in the city of St. Louis. I'm also the president of the citywide tenant affairs board. I'm a trainer. I train groups all over the country. I'm a mother to first. I represent almost 16,000 tenants in public housing in St. Louis, Missouri. People in public housing are very articulate. People in public housing are very skilled. They know what they want. Just because you are poor, you don't stop dreaming. The problem is that that source has never been tapped. That people assume all they can ever be are junkies, dope pushers, uh, pimps, or whatever. That is not true. My name is Mary Cotton. I'm the floor captain of the 13th floor. I've been here 20 years. I have nine kids. I raised six here. And when I moved in in 1966, it was a beautiful place. We had grass, flowers, security. Everybody worked together. It was nice and clean and comfortable. And now it's, it has got worse. And I hope and pray to live as you see and make it a better place in which to live. I guess what I've witnessed this week was something that I felt was there for the last year, and that was that residents have like people who live anywhere else want an opportunity to live in decent and safe and sanitary housing and unlike the general population they're willing because their environments have become so bad to participate in any process that would make it better they're hungry for it and you can see not only the desire intense desire but the sort of uh, hope and aspirations and desperateness that larger population never has to exist. My name is Ann Song. I'm president of this board, secretary of the LEC, and uh, I've got seven children. I had eight, one killed himself from this building. My purpose for this, this training, and hope I can be able to continue, is to learn how to organize our people and how to bring unity with our people so that we may all work together in order to make some of these changes that we need here in our building. If you look at the debate over welfare, it's easier to see how the society shifts back and forth on, a, on an issue that deals with disadvantaged people. Uh, we reflect that too. The debate about public housing is not quite so clear. You have to get into very esoteric congressional debates about the funding of very esoteric housing programs. Most housing authorities, when you go into their offices, they have lavish furniture. That's bought out of the subsidies and rents of public housing tenants. In St. Louis, we had an executive director that spent $15,000 on a credenza, $8,000 on one chair. I swear to God, he had eight chairs and you know how much money he spent. He spent his desk 
cost $50,000. He bought him not a Ford, like a little Ford. He bought him one of these long cars, almost a Cadillac, out of public housing dollars. And here we had public housing developments that didn't even have screens in the windows. Babies were falling out the windows, dying, because there was no screens in the windows. And he was spending $50,000 for a desk. This is their home. And what we see here today is the second generation of some residents, uh, uh, some of the resident families. They, they grew up, their mothers raised them here. They're now raising their own families here. And they plan to stay here. And they want it better. They remember when it was a good place to live, and they want it back. Now you're suggesting that through tenant management, people become enfranchised, become empowered, become competent in the society, and have a desire to stay there because they themselves have a, uh, may even have an economic investment in being there. This is no longer temporary housing. And their income and their enfranchisement is such that they could live in another kind of housing. Should they deny that housing unit that they're living in to some disenfranchised family? The, the other uh, reason to me that public housing has failed is because the housing authorities are paid for vacant units. I am absolutely positively against that. I think that there is no incentive from the housing authority if they're going to be paid for vacant units. There's no incentive for them to get the units rented if the federal government's going to pay for, pay for a vacant unit. That's why there's so many vacant units in Chicago public housing because the federal government since 1974 has paid the housing authority for vacant units. One of the problems I've had ever since I've been on the, the, the board is uh, how one can be just a policy-making body and yet be responsible for everything that goes on. And uh, to me, the most important thing then is that uh, you have a director that you really trust. That's the only way I can see that it can work. The one function that is ongoing at all times is the fact that it's a landlord. And the, the, there, there's two problems with that. The number one, there is no clear concept of management. If you look at the public housing budgets, they have deputy, and deputy, deputy, and deputies, deputy, deputy, and executive sec secretary, and an executive assistant secretary, and assistant to the executive secretary. That's where the money goes. And then finally somebody says, oh, we got to do something for the tenants. Because after all, this money is for public housing. And then maybe 10% of the budget is used to buy some windows, some doors, some paint, no stoves, no refrigerators, very few maintenance workers, no security, you know what I'm saying? So there's nothing left to operate the development off of because all the money is going toward the administration. And that is a fact. And I challenge any housing authority that's hearing me talking, I challenge them to say that I'm not telling the truth. Go through their budgets and let them explain their budgets to you, and you will find that 85 to 90 percent of their budgets is fat. We in, in St. Louis, you have a woman who uh, is very good at publicizing herself and publicizing what she's done there, and the project that she has uh, managed uh, and worked with and trained people for uh, obviously is much better than it was before. But the problem, what we need is more studies. I suppose the hope and the dream would be that uh, there would be tenant management in as many buildings as possible. I think until uh, the people in the housing developments uh, become concerned with their own welfare, and that certainly is, is important, and I think we should all work towards that in starting a little bit in Chicago. I think it's too slow, but I, I think it's the only hope. Well, I want to argue. The fact of the matter is that tenant management is a social activity. We're tired of it! We're tired of it! We ain't taking it anymore! We ain't taking it anymore! We're tired of it! We're tired of it! We ain't taking it anymore! We're tired of it. We're tired of it. We're tired of it. First of all, what I'm doing here in uh, Chicago is to train tenants in leadership development. The skills have to be taught to the people. The people have to be taught how to take care of themselves. 
Also, my role is to motivate the tenants and get them to organize floor captains, a structure in the building, to get floor captains and building captains and councils set up in the buildings so that there is an organization to begin to get tenants to buy in to the concept and make tenants responsible, to get tenants to sweep and mop their own floors, to get tenants to establish their own rules and their own regulations. Everybody else stay in the hallways, y'all don't say nothing. Yes, ma'am, we're dealing with you and others too. We'll, and you will have your chance to talk. Just hold up. So this is your, thank you, Mr. Jones. This is the reason we have you down here. We have, I'm getting you, you said, get on, girl. Now, as you have said, I'm getting you previously. I told you to stay away from them boys. They ain't no good, none of them. We are not going to have that. Now, what's going to happen if you continue to do this? You know, you know what's going to happen? Your mother's not going to have any place to live. Girl, you know you ain't getting me put out. <laughs> now, I got six more kids. Yes, you so. know you going to go live with your dad. So we're going to, with somebody hearing, my mom is going to be documented. All these people that saw you doing it. Now, I mean for you to stay out that hall. Do you hear me? Do we have, have any people? suggestions we might can give, Miss Gilkey? If her daughter, if there's a problem, do you have, do you have any problems with you come to the board, maybe we can help you. Thank you, way. I appreciate it. My daughter's going to apologize. I want you to apologize right now. I'm sorry. And that you're going to stay out these halls. I'm going to stay out And if out. you all see in this hall, tell me. Let me it's tell you one thing. I want to make sure when you see somebody else's child in them halls, I want exactly. you to tell them. Because I'm going to tell y'all about it. That's right. That's We're going to deal with all of them. Thank and we, very, we appreciate you very much for coming down. Thank you. Thank you, girl. My philosophy is, that the only people that can turn public housing around are the people who live there. The reason why I'm so effective is not because of my charisma, but because I live there. I am a public housing tenant. I grew up in public housing. I come from a family of 15 children. I come from a history of welfare. My mother was on welfare. I chose not to be on welfare with my children, but I understand it. So that's why it's so easy for me to go down there and train my people. Because I am one of them. Because I can come down here and I can give you all the skills and all the training. You got to save yourself. There ain't gonna be no white knight, black knight, Hispanic knight coming into here to save you. You got to save yourself. First of all, you got to understand the nature of the animal that you're dealing with. The animal that you're getting ready to take on is called Public Housing Authority. They understand you. They've studied you and know exactly what you will do and what you won't do. That's why we sit in this room now, okay? Because they know you don't have the skills to force them to be a responsible landlord. I'm going to give you the skills. The leadership training component was really broken into four different parts. Uh, the first part had to do with individual skills. Second part had to do with group skills. Third part had to do with group maintenance. And finally, uh, the fourth part dealt with group planning. In terms of individual skills, there were a couple of things that were essential. One had to do with those people involved in the program understanding the responsibilities and the role of leaders. Uh, secondly, there was an essential part that had to do with people learning how to listen, listen to one another, listen to themselves when they dealt with people. My name is Dolores Wilson. I'm president of the 1230 Burling Building Council in Cabrini Green. And uh, we are proud to say that uh, because we are interested and concerned about resident management, our <coughs> attendance at our building meetings have been overwhelming. Let's and, give him a hand. Uh, I was really surprised because uh, at the time, the adults in my building weren't functioning. And uh, I was working with the youth. And uh, we did so many things and uh, accomplished so much. And we wanted someone to come in and help us along, you know, do things with us and for us. Young men and women, they're supposed to have a workshop Friday in here on drug awareness for children from 15 on up to their parents who are 80, 90, or whatever the age, 15 years and up are supposed to have a workshop Friday with the beat reps. They work with the police department, and they come once a month. <laughs> Our young men wanted to um, paint the hole from up from the top floor down, but at that time it was too cold. So when spring 
college, we'll be able to do the paint job as we have in the And we want the, uh, the doors right there uh, closed up. And the ones on the and other the side. And the one on the back locked up. After 4.30 for the one on the back, after the job to get off. Control the traffic. Control the traffic so all the traffic will come in through here. Okay. I see you sneaking on the elevator. You're supposed to be at the meeting. We're having a meeting and we're going to take a call. You are our ministers, right? I would like to know uh, what could you all do to help us better our community and our building? Well, I think it's just been, it's been rich for me today. I, uh, I've seen some things that I had reservations about, but I can really see that there's a lot to be done. And as I said in the meeting earlier this morning, sometimes we think we know what you want, and we give you a package, and we think that will solve the problem. But I think today has served as first-hand information in terms of what you want, where you want to go, your goals and your objectives. We've had leadership workshops, which have really helped us. Of, you know, I know it's, with myself there are words that just stand out. You know, and every now and then when we're doing something, and you, you kind of forget, you know, and then things would come to your mind like documentation. You know, you have to have things documented. I'm a landlord. You the tenant. You move into my property, and me and you cool. Why can't it just be a handshake? Why do we need a written lease between the landlord and the tenant? Somebody from Cabrini. To make it legal, just like a marriage, you have to make it legal. That way that partner would do his part and the other party would do their part. And if they try to uh, renege, then you can, it's something in that lease where that you can sue them or get things in order. Okay. Go on, Peg. In consideration of the mutual agreements, my name is Peggy Byers. I live at 706 East 39th Street, part of Ida B. Wells. Management hereby leases to tenant and tenant hereby leases from management for a private dwelling, the unit designated above. to Goshen Seventh-day Adventist Church. At the moment, we don't have our own church, but uh, we're trying to find a building or to build. So we're renting from a church on 46 in Greenwood. Three children. I have a son, Michael, who's 26. I have a daughter, Adrian, who's 21. And I have a son, Robert, that's 11. I will be married 21 years, the 26th of this month. The media has given public housing the reputation of being a bad place to stay, which is not true. There are some I would prefer not to live in, but that does not mean that if you walk in the building, you're not walking back out. Because we have educated people in here just like they have on Prairie Shores or on the Gold Coast. It's just that they haven't had a chance to show it. And I've been here 20 years, like I said, and I've never had any problems. It's not as hard as people say it is. <clears throat> we have a lot of children in the building that have a lot of talent. We have a big open field across the street over there. That's the only place that those children have to play. We need some kind of recreational facilities in the building, across the street, and that big lot across there for the children. It's not hard to raise your children in here. It doesn't take nothing but the discipline. The Illinois Department of Public Aid stops a lot of people from really doing what they want to do. They tell you to go out and get a job, you get a job paying less than what you get. You're cut completely off public aid. You have to think about paying babysitting costs. You have to have car fare spent. And it's really hard. 
nobody comes and talk to you, to the residents and say, what do you all want to better yourself? They'll come in and say, well, we're going to do this, which is not good for everybody. They are making your own decision. They don't give you, as a citizen, the right to make your own decision. We're really not getting anything that we're paying for. We're not getting any mopped hallways swept. We have garbage pile-ups. And even residents, we have ourselves take our garbage downstairs. We try to, every way we can to help the janitor, but it doesn't do any good to clean up, and, and the janitors are not going to come behind us and finish the job and to keep it clean. When you're paying the rent in a regular apartment, you can, you're going to demand that things need to be fixed in your apartment will be fixed. Here, you can demand it, but nothing happens. I would like to see rehabilitation of the building for security reasons, for clean, you know, for the overall look of the building. I would like to be able for the tenants to screen who, to be able to say who we want in and who we don't want in. I would like to be able, if, if it's my family and my children do something wrong, I will be penalized for that. My first step was to be, get some training for the residents that's in the building and maintenance to be able to do the jobs themselves because who can do more for us than we can? You hear people say, which I hate, it bugs me when I hear a person say the projects. We do not live in projects. But you hear people, when they say that name, it's like, it's Vietnam. Uh, it's the slums, which it's not. It's a lot of decent people living in public housing. And they care about where they live and they want to be equal as everybody else. 97% of the people in public housing are good people. They are people who care. Only 3% are bad. But that 3% has been allowed to do so much. Kill, murder, rob, do everything, and nobody does anything about it, that the abnormal has become the normal. In public housing, it is normal for people to expect shooting. It's normal for people to expect to be robbed at some point. It's normal for people to expect their house to be broken into at some point. It's normal for you to expect your children to get strung out on drugs or whatever. Because that's what happens in public housing. Public housing for folks who want to break in people's houses. Public housing for people who want to rob. Public housing for people who want to throw garbage out the window. Public housing for people who don't want to discipline their children, want them to write on walls, want somebody else to be responsible for what they do. Public housing is for people who want to shoot anytime they want to, sell dope, chew dope, Whatever, the, you, whatever you can do with dope, they do it. That's what public housing is for. And who are you all to think or to say that you don't want these kind of people? Now, for the critics or the people on the outside who say that, and they go on to say that everybody in public housing do that. Everybody. So who are you all think you are to tell somebody they can't come into your building? Then what, then what are you going to say? I mean, what's, I mean why? I mean, what, what's going to be your response? I would say that uh, we're tired up and we're fed up and we're not going to take it no more. Yeah. Yeah. training session there was some discussion about and frustration about what was going on in terms of the things you were able to implement and I think we need to talk about that. We had came to an agreement that the majority of the people that's in the building are against tenant management for the most part because it's going to make them do right and we figure if that's going to get them, that's going to let them get a chance to vote and we know which way they're going to vote. They're going to vote against it because they're going to continue to do the same things they're doing now. 
And they, these people don't, another thing is, we were talking about, they just don't pay us any attention because they look at us like another tenant, not as a leader or anything like that. They, they put no importance upon us. And uh, we aren't about to give up. But then there's others, you just got to show them something. You got to match your bone, do something, before they're going to do anything. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of the people that, like some of them that came to the citywide meeting, they seem to be flustered already because they are looking for MPC to make CHA be accountable. Because one even asked, when are you all going to make C CHA give us the letter so we can tell these people what to do? They got to realize that you all can't make right. CHA do anything because we as residents haven't made them do right. anything in 20 years. Right. So we can leave the citations okay. up to Wait the manager. But everybody in your building should know about them citations and what when your building has been going through them, training and, and all that. They supposed to know. By that time, CHA will send One them of the most them. rewarding things was to see people uh, engaged in group planning and conflict to listen to one another, to say to one another, okay, I'm going to let you talk so I can understand what it is you're trying to say to me and to see resolutions come out of that. And very few few groups, and I don't care who they are, who were able to do that kind of thing successfully. Uh, it, it's a real accomplishment. told everybody on the floor about the citation, but once they saw it wasn't being enforced, they began to start right back up just like they was from the beginning. And it's, it's, it's really beginning to be rough for them. I never told you this was going to be easy or short term. And that we've got to start addressing, addressing the problems as they occur. So I hear you. We're going to deal with, with a lot of these issues this morning. But I think I think it's important. I think it's key for you to, for you to remember where we started from 15 months ago. And my goal is to bring together a marriage along with uh, with the team that's MPC and all the private sector and the foundations, the federal government, the housing authority to make public housing work. Welcome to this uh, update session of the MPC CHA project, which we try to do periodically for, for those of us who have, have joined in supporting you know, what we think is, is one of the most exciting partnerships between a civic organization and several civic organizations, as a matter of fact, and the residents of the developments of the Chicago Housing Authority. We have come such a very long way, yes, and people want to move into our building after visiting relatives or friends in our building and this. Uh, when you get ready for the screening, let me know. I want to move in. And when they go back to their building, they see the difference. Uh, the problem really is with CHA. Uh, it is not something that they are embracing. Uh, they feel uh, compelled to try it as a demonstration, but we are negotiating with them now on a day-to-day -day basis to try to get it implemented by February. CHA uh, in the past has spent over $909 million uh, dollars for folks to be securing the 19 development. And they sent a person around to just come and knock on one person's door and ask them how they feel and not, you know, not there uh, on hours, hours of basis. With the uh, residents securing themselves, they will be on uh, duty from uh, 24 hours per day. Yeah, and do residents uh, decide the screening procedures as well? Yeah. We, we uh, went on another training session. You know, sitting on the board when someone gets ready to move in, the questions that should be asked. It was fun because some of them we let in that shouldn't have been in, but that was all in the training, you know. But it was real fun. <laughs> I think what's really critical is that everybody, if everybody, if we leave here understanding that we believe that the residents make the difference, then we will have achieved a lot. All of the, the difference at Cochrane Gardens wasn't just bricks and mortar and money from HUD. And it was really the residents wanting to change their living environment. This is a side view of the building. There are balconies that the residents designed facing uh, towards the ground so that they could uh, better supervise and watch their children. I resent when people call my home a project because when people say project today, it's said in a negative connotation. It's not meant in a positive manner. And I resent that. 
Public housing is my home, it's my neighborhood. I feel as strong about public housing as any one of you feel about your neighborhood and your home. People that live in public housing live there, many of us live there by choice. It's our home, our friends are there, our families are there, our roots are there. So I, I do the things I do uh, going around the country, teaching people how to be free, teaching people how to live decent, safe, and sanitary, and wholesome in a holistic approach. how we redesigned it, because you all are working, some of you working with your architect. The, this used to be the back of copies. How you doing? Not my tent. This is now, yes you do. This, this is now the front of copies. See where we have all the patios facing each other? Like a courtyard, like a courtyard effect. Right, the other thing is you see, that where the air, that's where the air conditioners are. See the sleeves? Everybody's air conditioners are in those sleeves. Now what we getting ready to do now, we just had a meeting Monday. We're raising money to buy, to put in central air. We're putting central air in. Each building got to raise $2,000. And then our tenant management corporation is going to finance the rest. So two years, three years from now, every one of these buildings will be total central air. Right on. Mm. Okay? All right. I grew up in public housing and it was a beautiful community. I grew up in public housing where people wanted to move into public housing, not to move out of. I represent a generation of people in public housing. I grew up in public housing when uh, people were somebody that lived in public housing. So public housing is not a project to me. Public house in many of our cities, they take it as the dumping ground. So the residents in public houses throughout the U.S. must come together and say, this is our home, we care, and we're going to let you know that you care. That's why we have a Bertha Gilbert. That is why she has instilled in the majority of the tenant leaders throughout the U.S. I am a tenant leader in New Jersey, one of the one. We have so many that struggle, and tenant management is the key to turn public housing around. All our large families live on the lower floor. No large families live on the higher floor. Okay. See the room? Alexander, don't smell. <laughs> These are the large, don't this remind you of the like three? Yeah. 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 These are the condos. See how fancy those white apartments? Those are condos. They sell for $120,000 an apartment. Right across the street, see those brown, red brick? Those are privately owned. 675 units of marketing house. They rent for six fifty. dollars The first thing they did was just clean the buildings up. Real simple, common sense stuff. Paint the buildings. See, Catherine and them came to St. Louis. They were interested in tenant management, and we had started. I don't. I, don't, I think maybe we were about a year, about to a year, mm -hmm. about a year into to managing Cochran when they came, and uh, they looked at us, and we thought, God, we was grinning because we had painted the lobbies right, but we still had all these glasses. I mean, all these. Uh, it reminded me of 12:30 Berlin. I mean, we had, you know, we still had missing windows, right? Uh, we didn't have no door, no entrance door to the building, but it was clean. And we didn't have any grass, and we was just smiling because we really thought we had achieved something. Catherine, come and look. <laughs> I mean, what are y'all happy about? I mean, you know, what, what I mean, have you done? We afraid to go around the building. Right? That's how bad it was. We were afraid to go around the building. But then they don't know what it was before. <laughs> I want Miss Cicely to come in in case you want to ask her any questions, okay, about her building, what Cochran used to look like, okay. Miss Cicely, this group is from Chicago. They're, they're from Cabrini, Washington Park, and Ida B. I've been knowing Miss Cicely all my life. I'm a building captain here. I run the laundry room and uh, I oversee the community room. I'm, I'm one of the screening committees. I sit in on the screening. Uh, this kitchen is very large. The kitchens used to be where you couldn't, in fact, for me to get in, I had to use a stool. The kitchen was very small. Mm -hmm. And so they enlarged everything. This is a double apartment here. Okay. 
These walls are dry walls. They did this. And this is not all plastic, but the old building was all exposed. See this? This is a revolutionary new room pressure. Cochran Community Center is based here in the community as a service for the residents of Cochran Gardens Tenant Management. And we feel that by having accessible health care, it promotes good health to the residents because they won't have a tendency to let an illness linger on and let it go on until it gets into a more advanced stage. Right here, they can come here to the Neighborhood Health Center and get excellent service for a very cheap cost. In the fall, in September, after the kids come out of school, we're going to have a, a massive tutorial program and we're going to stress reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, back to the basics. Then we'll have the regular recreational programs, Little League uh, football, Little League baseball, softball, and so forth. We provide resident employment. That's important to us. Our residents manage our sites where we live at. We also put them in maintenance, custodians, security. Every department, every aspect of the management level, we have residents working. We then, in the daycare centers that we create and operate and own, laundromats that we open up, are all either owned or operated by the residents who live in the community. Through tenant management, we create senior programs because the other thing you get into is that you got a heavy senior population who are not being adequately taken care of. Because we live there, we, we have empathy for our seniors and we care about what happens to them. So that becomes a concern of ours. So then we sit with our seniors and we find out what are their needs. Then we begin to design programs to meet those needs. And designing those programs, you got to create jobs because you need folks to take care of the seniors. We provide the meals, somebody's got to cook the meals. Those are jobs for residents. Well, I, I, I like it all. <laughs> I like it all. I like it all. Okay. It's, we have an air condition, we have heat in the morning, so we have God here to watch over us. Unbelievable. The whole layout, the way they not only had the building and uh, the equipment and everything together, but the tenants also had a different frame of mind as far as just keeping the place together, cleaned up, working together. It was just magnificent. You think you I couldn't it? believe it. I was totally amazed. I didn't want to believe it. I said, this is what we want for the tenants in 1230 Berlin. We want a clean atmosphere, we want a clean elevator. Even where the incinerator was, it was speaking span. It was just like it was brand new and they had managed this building for years. You, you couldn't even tell that it was low income housing because it looked like something like on Lakeshore Drive. It was, it was really beautiful. It really made me want to keep doing what I'm doing until we are another St. Louis. Fire up! Fire up! Fire up! Fire up! I just want to say one other thing before he says anything. When we started working together two years ago, I told him when he was taking over after we became friends. And he didn't believe it. And his hair was all black. You know, he's been here two years. Now you see, this is what happens when you're a good executive director. <laughs> The way you measure any business, and that's what I think we in. I don't think we're a welfare organization. I don't think we're a social service organization. We're in the real estate business. And the way you me measure any business is customer satisfaction, ultimately. So for anybody that works at the St. Louis Housing Authority, they have to have a commitment to serve the residents who live in public housing. And I'm kind of hard-headed about that. And, it, and they don't have to do it out the goodness of their heart or anything. They get paid. I get paid, they get paid. So nobody's up there volunteering any service, and nobody, so therefore nobody's doing you a favor when they fix your faucet or, uh, or cut the grass. They got paid last week. I saw my mother to birth in them begging people, would you please come to a meeting? And sometimes it wouldn't be but 10 people at a meeting. That's the honest, but they just kept on. They started telling them the reality is that if we don't do something about this development, they're going to tear it down and where you going to live? You're going to go back to them uh, shacks that you were staying in, them cold water flats? Them folks start coming out. You have a leader in every development, just a sign. And that leader will pop up. You will not have to search for him because there's going to be someone 
who's going to be tied in the situation. We have some very, very intelligent people that live in public housing. Public housing no longer will people in public housing sit back and let the government say, this is our dumping ground. We have a responsibility to look at development in the city. We have a responsibility to house poor people, that we have to look at the crisis in housing, and that we've got to get smarter about how we plan development in the city and in all major cities, because it's not happenstance that people are homeless, um, doubling up, and that people are living in a country this rich in environments that are not decent and sanitary, that if we can document that the federal government has gotten out of the business of providing and subsidizing housing for low-income people, and that the private sector cannot provide that housing either because it cannot afford to or it doesn't want to, that we have to make some very serious decisions about what we're going to do to house people in this country. If you truly care about the poor, if you really care about Chicago public housing and understanding that there is no longer any low-income housing being built for large families, and that a Cabrini Green or Robert Taylor's or Ida B. Wells or Washington Park is all that they have as it relates to housing for large families in this country. And unless we stabilize and make those housing complexes work, those people are going to join the homeless. They will be on the streets. They will be in your house. They will be at your back door. They will be waiting for you on the parking lots. If we don't do something to stabilize that housing group, there is almost 5 million people living in public housing in this country and 96% are women and children. That's what this country is going to have to address in the next 10 years. If we don't assist the people in public housing how to take control of their destiny and how to take control of their housing. Two and a half years ago, we started this program. People said we couldn't do that. We made a lie out of a lot of people. So one thing you got to understand, when I took on this project, I understood it very clearly, because I grew up in Harrison Courts. I am a product of the housing development. And I stand proud with you tonight and every night, because I know that character is in the body. It is not in a place. Right. And we have to prove that a lot of people are wrong about us. Right. And that we have a place in this society, and we're going to take that place. All right. All right. So you join me when we finish this and party. Showing the concern, showing the creativity, uh, showing a willingness to use the resources, financial and human. I'd like to take my hat off to the Metropolitan Planning Council, Ms. Bertha Gilkey, and all of the young people who have gone through the training that is so necessary for you to do the job that we're expecting. And we are just so appreciative, we are so pleased that <coughs> I bring you our love and congratulations from LeClaire Courts. There is no way that I can succeed with what I hope to do without you and more people like you. And when you, when other residents see what you've done, we hope that next year we need to have this meeting in McCormick Place. like the quick people live on Peel Hill. So call us our low income condominium 
right? <laughs> so there's no turning back. With you, Vince, you're going to stand by us, and we're going to stand by you. That's right. I think what this evening's uh, program is about is about work. There haven't been any shortcuts. It's been hard work, and you've achieved. You see the goal. There aren't going to be any shortcuts from here on in, but you are going to reach that goal. I know that as sure as I'm standing here. I really couldn't believe that this was happening to us because this was like a dream come true. I just feel like we are going to make it. You know, I just know we're going to make it. Information frees everyone, and it has freed me. I've learned a lot, I've passed on a lot, and I plan on keeping on, keeping on. I see a rebirth of public housing. I see a rebirth of a group of people that have been sleeping for a long time. I saw hope in those people's eyes that they never really gave up. That they just said, well, maybe one day things are going to change. Things will get back to the way they used to be. Public housing will be decent, safe, and sanitary. In Chicago, you got sleeping giants. What we're doing now. As a team, we are waking those sleeping giants. 